Hey everybody, welcome to DBS Films Podcast. My name is Kellen, with me as always is my brother Brendan. Together we make movies with DBS Films. And in today's episode, we're going into part one of how to make a low-budget found footage movie. And if you listen to our last episode, it was about why you should do this as a filmmaker. But we want to take these next two episodes to basically describe to you guys what the process will look like, what are some of the pitfalls, and really advise you on how you can potentially make your first feature film and your first found footage movie. So before we go ahead and hop into it, be sure to take a look at our Discord online. We make movies for our fans with our fans. If you ever wanted to be part of the process or on set with us, that is the place to be. So, you know, before we go ahead and hop into the actual specifics of it, I really kind of wanted to quickly recap why we mentioned that as an indie filmmaker, you should explore found footage. Um, One of the major ones is it will help you be forgiven for a lot of technical difficulties when it comes to just filming a movie. The second thing is it's also going to go ahead and mask a lot of the production issues because of the nature of found footage is they're more gritty. They're, you know, more realism in the POV element. And it just costs a lot more to film a cinematic style movie. And then the third thing, and one of the major things that we mentioned is it's a lot easier to get this found footage movie through post as long as you finish the production just due to the nature of found footage and all this wrapped together can actually mean a very good indie level low budget production so do you want to quickly talk about how kind of all of those things could make it so that it's a very feasible and more importantly this could be a movie that has a very high odds of making its money back yeah i think when you're uh when you're first starting out you know, your goal should be to upload something and then try your best to get your money back. And you really want to make these movies for as low as possible because unless you have experience working on films and you're working on films in a role that is active in the the movie, so you're not just like a grip or a PA, you're actively working on a production um, if you don't have that experience, your odds of success, you know, starting your own movie and making your own movie are very, very low, just because it's such a crazy process. There's so many moving pieces. You have to work with so many different people that it's just, it's very difficult to be able to number one, complete a movie and number two, make a movie that, you know, doesn't have a lot of pitfalls that flows properly. That's well paced. And even the fact that if you get to, you know, an uploaded movie, then you have to go through distribution and marketing, which is just as difficult, if not more difficult to navigate. So for your first couple of movies, the odds are really stacked against you. And instead of, you know, a lot of indie filmmakers really want to wait for the perfect time. They want to have the perfect actors. They want to have the perfect DP. They want to have the perfect script. They want to have, you know, the perfect budget. And I think we're just the opposite of that. I think, You should always be creating things. You should always be getting better with each movie that you make. And the way to do that is to do it for as cheaply as possible. The only thing that you could really have control over on a movie is your budget, how much money you're actually going to spend on this thing. And the cheaper you can do it, the better, um, because usually it'll be more streamlined and you have better odds of, you know, success of getting your money back when you get to the distribution phase of it. So I am firmly in the camp of instead of making, you know, a hundred thousand dollar movie, we try and make four twenty five thousand dollar movies. I think you're diversifying your risk. You're going to get better. The incremental gain, the gains, or the ex- actually exponential gains from movie one to movie four, are just incredible. I mean, we're on our twelfth movie now, and just the jump from number ten to twelve is absolutely ridiculous it's really incredible and it's to the point now where i go back i'm like man i really wish i would have you know had the knowledge and skills that i did when i shot like girl in cabin 13 because i think it would have been a better production but i don't think a lot of filmmakers get to that point because they make one movie and then they give up and i'm sitting here telling you trying to make it try and make as many as you possibly can because it is a skill and with any skill you have to cultivate it you have to do your reps and you have to get better and it really leads into found footage is a really easy way to do that because it allows you to focus on all these things you know for a budget that is more independent uh filmmaker friendly exactly that i mean again i think people are really they have a lot of focus that making the movie is the end goal. You make the movie, you're done. You're going to get picked up. All of these things, making the movie is just a single step in multiple movies that you need to go ahead and make. So 
what we want to try and do here is basically give you guys as much tools or information that we can provide to allow you to go out there and film a found footage movie. Also give you advice on how to get through pre-production, production, and post-production, and to basically give you the highest odds of hopefully making your money back. Because again, if you can make your money back, you can do it again. And that's where you're really going to get the skills. That's where you're really going to get the experience. So I will say there is a very big caveat to a lot of the information that we're going to talk about. And I think this is honestly always going to be the most critical thing when it comes to indie filmmaking. Nowadays, it has never been easier to make a movie because of the technology and the information at your fingertips. With that being said, though, it's never been harder to get that movie seen and also kind of to get your money back on that because of how much content can be out there. One of the easiest ways that you can control your budget, and we're going to say this about whether it's found footage or cinematic, is that you as a filmmaker need to do as much as humanly as possible. The reason that our budget is so low is because if you look at writing, production, post-production, it's essentially me and my brother. That's it. And we cost a grand total of zero dollars for our work. So that really, really assists in the process of keeping these budgets low. Now, the idea here is if you are going into this project already thinking that you either need a writer or you need a director or you need a producer or you need all these things, I'm going to tell you you have the complete wrong idea. You need to be approaching this with the idea that with myself and the resources I have, I can take a movie from writing it, filming it to post-production and you might say oh man that sounds like a lot perfect make a very small found footage movie do this though do this entire process because the best thing you can learn is going through that whole process you get experience in every single section and if it sounds daunting and it sounds like a challenge for you well that's good that shows that you need to have this experience so before we get tactile do you want to talk about the importance of i think the the you know siloing your roles in movies is great in Hollywood, but it does not work effectively in the in the filmmaking. Not to say it's impossible, but you're already going to the more people you have on set and the more people you have to pay, there goes your budget right out of the gate. And one of the major factors that we have, not only for keeping the budget low, but also for us gaining experience, is the fact that we run a incredibly streamlined crew. Yeah, well, it's twofold. I think you just have to kind of look at it like, number one, those people are going to cost you money. Every single person you have on set is going to be paid a day rate, and they're going to cost money. And then they have you have to feed them. You have to pay for transportation. It adds up very, very quickly, and that's multiplied by how many people you have set on set. The second thing is your time. And time on most sets, especially our sets, is more valuable than the actual money because you have to get these things done. We have a very aggressive shoot schedule and an hour, you know, loss because you're trying to wrangle people up or get people to, you know, get in one location um, is very costly. And we used to shoot with large crews and it was just very difficult to get everyone in one spot. We'd always be like, all right, we're starting to shoot at seven o'clock in the morning and it was by like 8, 30, 9 o'clock before that camera started rolling. Well, if you lose two hours in a day, that's almost 20% of your day. And you just can't have that. Where now it's just pretty much myself being like, all right, guys, this is where we need to go. Let's go. And I still have to wrangle the actors because, you know, everyone kind of just, they, it takes them a little bit to get going. Um, but, you know, as long as you're you're firm with what you're saying, when I say, look, this camera at seven o'clock, I'm going to press the record button. You guys better be out here ready to go. Um, you know, if you if you make that clear and you you actually follow up on what you say, like you can't say that and then, you know, not do it. Um, you'll get kind of a respect on set and you'll run an efficient set, but you got to be on them constantly. Like it's just the thing. Even the PAs, anybody on your set, you have to be on them constantly just because I understand how valuable time is. We've been pushed against, you know, the sun rising or the very end of like our shoot multiple times. I'm just like, man, I wish I had an extra hour here um, or an hour there. And I, I know how valuable it is. But I think if you're coming in here with the idea of having a big crew, like having multiple PAs to help you out, I think that's the bad way to look at it. I'd almost look at it like, all right, let's cut as much as we possibly can, the bare minimum. And then try and figure out, you know, where we need to go with that. And it like really, unless that person adds a lot of value, don't bring them on set. And that's just pretty much it. Just do not bring them on set. Um, everyone on our set has a very specific role. They understand their role and they're very, very good at their role. 
And I do want to bring on other people, but I just haven't been able to find one where it's like, all right, like this guy's going to add a ton of value to make up for, you know, the, the time investment that to put in this person and also the monetary investment. <clears throat> exactly that. And again, if you're out there and you're like, oh man, that sounds intimidating. Now I have to potentially film this. I would say, and, and this is actually, I'm curious to get your um, thoughts on. I think at a minimum, unless you have access to a really good, like I think you have really two options here. You have to really learn everything you can, or you have to find someone like you were mentioned, that's really good and in it for the long run, you know, whatever that might be. But I think at a minimum, you should really look at filming and editing the the process yourself um, and writing. I think you should look at writing, filming and editing this yourself. I think those are going to be the best things you can learn as a, a an indie filmmaker. And if this is sounding like something intense and perfect, you're in the right exact spot here, you know, make a found footage, make it your first one, understand this. You're going to get very, very um, lenient when it comes to the actual quality of the, the um, uh, cinematics because it's found footage. So you can learn that way. And then you're going to get the, the editing element. So would you say like, if I'm an indie filmmaker, I should at least, write film and edit this thing to some degree you know that i think is is kind of the key critical part if you want to get the most experience out of this and if you want to keep it low budget yeah i think it i think it'd be very difficult to make a movie under 50k if you're not doing all three phases if you have to hire a team of writers if you have to hire a dp and an assistant camera guy and they have to hire editors i mean your cost is going to spiral out of control very very quickly once again, it's not just your cost, like your time to get the writers all together to write this script is going to take a lot of time. You're looking at years to get a DP to come out and shoot an aggressive schedule. You know, they might be on their own timeline. A lot of DPs like to make demo demo tapes, um, demo reels for their stuff. They know what shots they want to really get a you know a good shot on, so they can spend extra time on that. You know, making all the lights look really nice and making sure they have really cinematic shots. And that may not be in your best interest. You got to move fast. You got to be aggressive and you can't be sitting here, you know, for the perfect lighting, you know, waiting for all this stuff to happen just to get the perfect shot. And then editors, man, like we get lost in the, the abyss of just editing. Um, and I'm one, to, you know, push myself forward. I feel like I'm doing a lot of hours each day and these things like just to edit these things is such a time consuming thing. If you're giving it to an editor who's working multiple jobs, um, you may not be the priority. So that could easily go from, you know, usually our editing, we do three or four months in post. And that's with me aggressively working on this. Um, if you have an editor that you're working with that isn't priority um, or your project's not priority with them, it could be a year before we get this back. And I think that's what a lot of indie filmmakers see. So, I mean, I, I'm really bullish on the filmmaking industry. Um, I think that the the filmmakers who are able to make movies for under 50K are going to be really rewarded. But I think in order to do it in a fast, efficient way with the budget in mind, you have no choice but to write, direct, shoot, and edit these movies. And the filmmakers that are doing really well right now, especially the ones in AVOD, are usually the ones who write, shoot, direct, and edit their movies. I just don't think... Um, you know, where the industry is going with the compression, um, it's it's possible for you to really, you know, do this with budget in mind if you're not doing all those phases. You know, once I get to Hollywood, once we're on some, you know, bigger multi-million dollar uh, shoots, would I love to just direct and work with the actress? Yes, absolutely. Um, but your learning curve will also accelerate as well. Um, and this is where we are right now. This is what needs to be done. And it's what we're doing. And this allows us to move so much faster than everyone else. And we can do that a fraction of the cost, which honestly for DBS films is a competitive advantage. Yep. And again, we're trying to help you out as an indie filmmaker, and this is just our recommendation, but I wanted to make sure that was very clear when we're hopping into this process. Cause you know, it's going to really tie back to a lot of those elements. And again, use the found footage as that learning experience. This is the type of movie that it's here for. You know, we've mentioned before, you're going to be able to get away with a lot of things that would just be cardinal sins in cinematic for multiple reasons. And you can learn, you can get this development here and you will have an uploaded product, which again, is going to be one of the most important things. So 
we're going to go ahead and break down each of the different elements here. We're probably just going to get into the pre-production element of, um, well, probably the writing, the pre-production in this episode. And then after that, we'll do production and post-productions on a found footage movie. Really to kind of hop in, you know, first thing is going to be writing a movie. And, you know, I really enjoy the writing process. Probably one of my more favorite ones because, like, it's the most creativity and kind of like the least amount of actual, you know, tedious work. I mean, sure, writing and doing those things does add up there. But uh, I'm a big fan of the writing phase of just all of our movies. And I would say, you know, really these key things for the found footage movies can apply to everything. Um, the big thing I kind of wanted to mention about now is really you can shoot yourself in the foot so badly when it comes to your entire production if you don't keep the low budget in mind as you're starting this film in this feature so really one of the things that i think we can see is as an indie filmmaker i can see when people bite concepts that are just way too big for their budgets again you're being compared to hollywood movies you probably don't really have necessarily an understanding of like what the budget scale is but i think the first thing that i'll mention with writing is when it comes to found footage movies it almost by the nature of it being found footage, it grounds it in reality. And I think that's one reason why found footage movies typically are seen a lot more in the indie uh, area, because it will keep you to a small concept that basically is something typically filmable. You know, a group goes here, they have to record, you know, so you're not trying to pull these crazy scenes or anything there. But what ends up happening a lot is it just in itself will create more of that environment. So before we hop into the details of writing, do you want to again stress how, you know, there's no reason to write big, you know, write small, keep chiseling away, keep that concept core and focus in really on what you have. So I think, you know, the biggest recommendation starting off is keep it small, but focus in on what you have. Maybe you have a location that you can go back to. Maybe you have actors that you can reuse. Start to really think in the writing phase of how you can utilize all of the assets you have at your fingertip to keep this budget down and to make production easy. You know, the number one issue I see with independent filmmakers is they write stuff that's just way too big. I see a ton of sci-fi movies that are just ridiculous that would be hard to pull off with a $5 million budget. So it's, it's very difficult, um, you know, as a filmmaker to do that kind of stuff, especially on an indie level. And I get emails all the time with these scripts and within the first couple of pages, I'm like, this is a $5 million movie. Like you can't shoot this for $50,000. It's just impossible. And I think a lot of independent filmmakers suffer, suffer from that. Some of the best indie films are ones that, you know, take place in one location, have two people. Um, Coherence had like four or five different people in there, one or two locations. It's an indie darling. So you have like all these, you know, independent filmmakers who want to go big. And that's fair. You want to tell like a cool idea. And I'm sitting here telling you, even from our experience, our more simple movies have done better. Devil in the Room, one of our highest budget movies, complete flop. Girl in Cabin 13, two people go in a cabin. That's it. Successful. It was That was our highest grossing movie before we made Murder House. Same thing with Suicide House. We made Suicide House in five days. And that movie like did an absolute you know great job. And I think Morgan Estate with the pickups and everything was like nine or ten days. And that movie did not come close to doing the work that Suicide House did. And I see it now, man. The more like the smaller, more minimal, minimalistic movies allow you to focus on story, and that's what people really want. You got to be able to tell a good story when you're doing all these crazy plot lines, these big scenes. It kind of detracts from that. So, you know, my thing with like found footage, and the reason why I think it's successful is because you can get something like Blair Witch Project. Three people in the woods just wandering around, screaming out like at nothing in the night. People like it. Um, you know, the next movie we're going to try and do is just pretty much me and like one actor. Um, and we're going to go out in the woods and he's going to slowly lose his mind. That's just what we're going to try and do. What do we need? We need one actor. We need the woods. And then obviously, as Kel said, you want to use your resources. What are my resources? We have some locations around here that we know we can use. And we have actors. We've cultivated a nice little community of people who I've worked with before that I enjoy working with and we bring them back. So guess what the first characters that I'm writing in to this next movie are? We got Aries coming back. We got uh, Officer Reynolds, Brent's coming back. And these are guys that could get out here for one day, give it a little bit of production value. And, uh, you know, 
make this thing happen. So, you know, writing the script, I want to make it the most simple, basic thing possible. Then I want to start looking at right, what resources do I have as far as like locations that I can get for free or for a very low amount. And then what actors do I have access to that are local that I don't need to fly in or do anything crazy. And that's how you write a script. I don't start with this, you know, $10 million idea um, and just be like, all right, well, how do I take this $10 million idea and make it for 25 grand? You're just not going to do that. Um, you need to understand where you are in the process. And right now we're very, you know, very bare bones budget. This is just where we are. Do I want to make million dollar ideas? Yeah. Do I have 10 million, hundred million dollar script ideas? Yeah. And I write those for fun, but where we are right now is we want to make these things quick. We want to make these things cheap. We want to learn and we want to move on to the next one. And that all starts in the writing phase. 100%. It's so unfortunate when you see issues that they suffer throughout the entire production and post-production process that literally could have been avoided if you simply have that mindset going into it. And I will say, I probably should have mentioned this at the beginning of the movies, um, but the way that we are essentially giving you guys our experience is we have made three found footage movies in production. Two of them are released. We have the uh, Into the Forest, and then we have the um, Haunting the Suicide House. Into the Forest 2.0 is basically what we're saying because we revisited it. So now that we kind of mentioned Keep It Small, let's talk about story concepts. And this is one where, you know, I suggest you take a, a a play out of our book and just watch as many found footage movies as you can. Kind of see like what the similar things are. They have a, the ones that are good typically have a theme. It's either one location, groups goes to locations, things get slightly worse and worse and worse. It's a great model. And I think the thing is, is, you know, for instance, for Into the Forest it is a group of investigators or YouTubers um, or documentaries in the, the second version. They go to a forest that has high abductions. There's a lit there's a lore about a witch. Very straightforward plot. Suicide house. They go to the house. They lock themselves in. It's a paranormal house. Um, very straightforward plot here. But I think the big thing I kind of want to stress here is a lot of times when it comes to found footage, you know, people might try and go above and beyond and be like, oh, I want to take a different take that no one's seen found footage. This is something they talk in the film industry a lot. There's nothing wrong with taking a good, solid concept. If you look at just concepts in the sense of, you know, themes, being in the woods, going to a location. Yes, those have been done before because they work. So you can take your own twist. It makes it a completely different story. You know, it's like complaining that you've seen one picture of a sunrise. If you ever see another picture of a sunrise before, it is completely different. You can have the same script and you have two different um, directors. In my opinion, in our opinion, you get two different movies. So I think when it comes to the concept, there's nothing wrong with sending them into the woods and there being like a witch there. There's nothing wrong with them going to a house and the house is haunted and recording it. So I think, you know, the point I'm trying to make here is don't, try and say, oh, I'm going to make the most intense found footage ever. If anything, copy something that has a proven track record, just in the sense of, you know, character, environment, um, a villain or whatever. Because again, your mission isn't to reinvent the wheel here. It's just to make your very first wheel. You know, it's to make your very first movie. It's to get it up there. And if you have those guidelines with things that work, it only means it's going to be better to sell in the, the end. But I do think something, especially with found footage, because of the nature of it, if you have found footage and you go into the woods, what are people going to scream? Blair Witch, no matter what it is. So I think to me, this is just telling the filmmakers out there that you're able to go ahead and work within, you know, cliches and things that work, um, especially in found footage. So don't stress out about those things. Yeah. Well, no matter what with found footage, people are going to scream Blair, Witch. we have murder house, which is not even a found footage movie. And people think it's related to Blair, Witch. it's not in the woods. It's it has a clown instead of a witch. And it's not found footage. And we get all these comments about people comparing it to Blair Witch. I think it's just some weird thing um, with people. It's not even a found footage movie either. Um, but to get back to what he said, yeah, no, 100% agree. There's a reason why movies are successful. And there's no harm and foul in trying to put yourself in a situation to make a movie similar to that. Just make sure you put your own like spin on it. Don't be just stealing people's stuff. And to just show you like... We just did Into the Forest 2.0. This is a very close concept story-wise to the first Into the Forest movie I did a couple years ago. Same story, similar scripts, 
and I could show two people the same movie or Into the Forest 1 and Into the Forest 2, and they would think they're completely different. And the reason is that because we just got a lot better at what we, we do, at what we're doing. The story is cleaner. It's more minimalistic. It focuses on the core aspects of grief and loss, and it's clear. The special effects are much better. The action and pacing is much better. So, I mean, this is two movies, extremely similar scripts, extremely similar concepts in the woods, and they look completely different. And this is me. I directed both of them. So it's like if you're worried about putting making a movie about a witch in the woods, you think it's going to be too close to Blair Witch, I don't think you can make Blair Witch if you even tried. Um, I think it's just there's so many variables that go into making a movie that honestly you should not be worried. This should be one of the least thing like worried things that you should be in the filmmaking process. You should never worry, oh man, am I gonna make a movie that is too similar to this that people are gonna yell at me for? I I unless you're copying them like line for line, I really don't think anybody's gonna care. There's a million movies where people go out in the woods and bad things happen to them. Even before before Blair Witch even started, there's a million movies that do that stuff. Um, million haunted house movies. Paranormal Activity was made a like way before, um, you know, multiple times before, and even the like the Unfriended series that Blumhouse did is made uh, did one like in the early two thousands, the Colin Collinsworth story, and it's pretty much a a very similar, very very similar movie to the Collinsworth story, so. I mean, they do these things all the time. If you're worried about that, I I mean, I just think as long as you're putting your own unique twist on it, you're doing it yourself. I don't think this has to be, you know, worried. You have to worry about it. And I mean, just look at like Hollywood today. They tell a lot of the same stories because they sell. People are looking for specific things. They're looking for, they love witches. They love haunted houses. Um you know, those are tropes that you want to hit and there's nothing wrong with going where the money is going where your audience wants to go. But just once again, make sure you put your own unique twist on it. That's where your creative where creativity comes in. You have your own unique characters, your own situations, your own scares. Um, that's your own personal touch. Completely agree in that sense, because it's something that we just hear and see so often. And like, don't let that slow you down. Like if you're going to just you know, trap yourself in the writing phase because you're trying to do something unique. And the thing is, is the only thing that happens is, of course, these ideas are gravitating to this because you can actually film these with found footage. You know, you can find a location. So I think the last thing I want to talk about when it comes to writing a found footage movie um, really comes down to the pacing of it. And regardless if this is your first movie, you're going to be terrible at pacing. I mean, it's something where we're always working on pacing and always improving. And, you know, we find that in your head, the movie feels really, really quick. You know, every time we write one, it's like it feels really quick. And then in hindsight, you see it could be a lot faster. But I think one of the pitfalls you see with a lot of found footage movies is it goes incredibly slow. And then one major thing happens, almost kind of like a bottle rocket where, you know, nothing's really happening, nothing's really happening. And then, you know, they, whatever, something happens, the camera falls over and then, you know, you're going to credits. So I think just in our experience and the reason I want to touch on this is really try and think your movie out as little checkpoints in the sense of, of beats, but really try and figure out a way early on to get some scares. I mean, you know, watch, I would say by the time, you know, you might be listening to this, ideally into the forest 2.0 is out. I have a completely different movie, but man, that's a really, really good example of good pacing. And try and think of little things that can scare you in the sense of, you know, we have a light bulb falling onto the screen and making a noise. We have uh, their trespassing and someone pulls a shotgun to their face. All of these things are early on scares to get the blood going. Because I think what we find with a lot of found footage movie, there's a lot of walking. There's a lot of talking. And speaking of talking, don't have them bully each other. Like just have them be nice for the most part. That's that's another trope we see. But it's basically a whole lot of nothing and then one thing happens. So I think the last recommendation we have is really focus heavily, especially on the intro, and especially within the first few sections, if you can find a way to hook people. Because again, you know, I think anytime you make a first movie, it's going to be a lot slower than you think. And I think that's one thing we see a lot in found footage movies is it really has a slow burn in the beginning um so when it comes to writing it try and spice that up as much as you can 
Yeah, I would agree. I think uh, most found footage movies suffer from pacing issues because they they suffer from three things, which is the first one is they don't have a good intro. The intro is not engaging. Um, It can be very boring and immediately you're starting off bland and then you have to develop your story for the next 15 minutes. You have 20 minutes where nothing happens. And look, I'm totally fine with making a slow burn horror movie. Um, Lake Mungo is one of my favorite found footage movies. And it's slow burn all the way through. That being said, that's one of the very few slow burn movies that is actually very, very good. Most of them are not good at all. You have to understand the environment right now with distribution, which is all your money's coming from AVOD. If people are not watching those ads, you're not going to get paid. So you have to keep that in mind. You have to keep people engaged. So I think with found footage, right off the bat, if you don't have a good intro, you have to develop your story and you're going to have 20 minutes of just very boring stuff. The second thing is it's very easy to narrate to the camera for ended periods of time. And if your story is not engaging, if what the actor is saying to the camera is not engaging, it's going to be very boring. Um, a lot of found footage stuff is just wonders. And, you know, when it's a wonder, it's, it can be very, 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 um, you know, if it's not engaging, it can be very boring. And if you have multiple interviews, multiple Lord Doms, you know, people are going to turn it off. So I think what we do with Into the Forest 2.0, you want, um, you know, all the stories that the person was saying or they were narrating to the camera are very engaging. There are stories about loss, about grief, or just building the tension, the stakes to the viewer. And so we did like pop scares, pop scares, and then we had like lore building and, you know, then we went back to the scares where I've seen a lot of stuff in found footage movies where it's just lore dumps, lore dumps, lore dumps. Um, and it could be, you know, a big time issue. The other thing is like what Kel said is there's a lot of walking, you know, you, you can't cut together a cinematic movie or a, a found footage movie in a cinematic movie. If a scene is long and boring, I could chop it up really quick with quick cuts to speed it up. Can't really do that in found footage. You got to move at the pace of the camera. Um, so I think a lot of found footage movies find themselves in a situation where they got to get to the house. They go to the house, they follow them walking in the house. Then they have to develop the lore of the house and they have stories about the house and they got to walk around the house some more and there's no action and you, you can't really cut around any of that stuff. So, I mean, you really have to just keep all that stuff in mind, make sure you're really pushing you know, the limits of how much stuff you can do. And usually it's probably not enough. Um, you know, I'm interested to see, uh, you know, one of the final cuts of into the forest to just to see if I could have pushed it even harder for the one we're doing in December. I'm really going to try and just make it absolutely crazy movie just because I want to see how far you can push it and just see what people's reactions to a found footage movie where everything is happening constantly. Um, so I want to see, uh, you know how that plays out but um, other than that I mean you just you got to make sure these things are paced pacing is the hardest thing for indie filmmakers and it's something that should really take most of your time and attention just make sure these movies move as quickly as possible that's right spice it up friends make sure things are popping out there make sure things are interesting um, it's going to always move a lot slower than you think in your head so we're going to move on from the writing phase and we're going to hop into what i would say we point back to one of the reasons why our last shoot the 12th movie that we've made which is a found footage film and the forest 2.0 was so smoothly and that is pre-production before we kind of hop into pre-production um really i think the main reason why pre-production is so important is the hardest part of found footage can typically be the production element to it and particularly it can be on the actors one of the things that i like to refer to that you see in found footage movies is having actors being left on an island and the way that i i mention it like this is when you're acting in a scene in found footage, it could be a five, six page scene. You know, we had a lot of really long scenes, especially the ritual. These were very intense scenes for our actors. Um, you know, we looked at theatrical actors, actors with experience that could handle these level of lines because in found footage, if you screw up, you end the entire take for everyone. So that is a huge, huge, huge constraint. When it comes to cinematic, we can get anyone to cut them up bit by bit and get their best performance through it. When it comes to found footage, 
the take that we use might be take four or five or six and you as an actor have to bring it every time. And I think we did a fantastic job casting, which really helps out. We have a lot of very passionate people from our discord, which really helps out. But I think the thing that you can do to set yourself up, and we mention this all the time, and it's weird that this is one of the things that just gets ignored from um, indie filmmakers is the pre-production element. And specifically, you know, I want to get your thoughts on how pre-production is super critical for the actors because they are the ones that are really doing the heavy lifting on found footage. Yeah, I think pre-production is even more critical for found footage than it is for cinematic. And the reason is... You know, you have to do these long, long oners and you really want to have a lot of improv in there. If someone misses a line or misses a beat or something, the actors can stay in the moment. So you're getting these usable takes. And, you know, for Angel the Forest 2.0, I look for people who had a theater background or theater experience. And I had, I look for people who had a lot of improv experience. And improv experience is great. Um, but my, experience with improv actors is if they don't understand their character if their character is not very clear if their character motivations in the scene are not very clear they're going to have a hard time doing improv and the way you make sure that everybody's on the same page that they understand their character they know exactly you know what the character is going to say and the, the dialogue that you're giving them is natural um to them how you get to that level is through pre-production. And I did a lot of pre-production with Into the Forest too. And we made sure that everyone was so clear on what they were trying to do that if somebody missed the line, they would be able to just keep the momentum of the scene, stay in the character, stay in the moment, stay in the scene without missing a beat. And I thought they did such a good job. And they were, we had a lot of improv. We had a lot of organic scenes. They understood what they were trying to do. They were hitting the beats that they needed to hit as far as dialogue to keep the scene moving. But for the most part, like we had a lot of very organic, you know, scenes. And that's what you want as a director. You don't want, you know, forced dialogue, forced scenes because it comes off as robotic. And that's where you get the, the negative reviews on bad acting. If it's natural, then guess what? They're not acting. They're actually just there in the moment. And we had a lot of those scenes. And I'm really excited to see the reviews of the actors in this next movie, the Into the Forest 2.0 movie, because I think this was the biggest jump as far as going from our old stuff to like, I think we hit like a new milestone or a, a new, like um, we moved up the ladder a little bit more as far as just getting actors in here and working with them in pre-production and getting really organic performances from them. Yeah, so I think a good summary, when you're casting your actors, theater background is going to be a big one, but then also, like, you just really need to work with them because they are going to be the ones that are carrying, you know, the weight here. And typically with found footage, what is it? It's usually a group, and then it's usually, you know, accessory characters or just additional side characters on top of that. So it's really important you focus in on your core casting. You know, you mentioned the pre-production, do you want to just walk through kind of what the pre-production look through on like a higher level? Again, I think one of the big things is, I mean, utilize technology nowadays, utilize the ability to have these Zoom calls and utilize these things. But I think the more the merry you work through them, one, it's going to improve your writing, like you're saying, because they're going to have their feedback. It's going to get them used to it. But really, you know, one of the reasons why our set weren't so smoothly is it puts you on the same page. So, you know, when you understand what's going on and you're able to basically reference your conversations from before versus explain them to begin with, it's completely night and day on set. Yeah. And I even, you know, we did more pre-production than this one that we've ever done in any other movie. And I even asked the actors, you know, when we wrapped, I was asking them like, what can I do better? How can I get better as a director? And they said, do even more pre-production and i was concerned that you know i was doing too much pre-production with them already that i was kind of like encroaching on their time and they wanted even more pre-production so if you're a director and you're worried about doing pre-production and encroaching on people's time do the actors are there with you you know they sign up for this project for a reason everybody's in the same boat they want to be comfortable the way you get everyone comfortable on the same page is through pre-production. And really it started working on pre-production because we were having actors come on set who weren't reading the scripts. They didn't understand things. They didn't know scenes existed and they were just showing up on set and just pretty much trying to ad lib the whole thing. 
And I was like, all right, we can't have this. So I would literally start by sitting down, doing Zoom meetings or sitting down with them, making sure, like reading through the script. So they're reading their stuff and understanding it. Then we started to really, you know, have issues with dialogue. So I started working with the actors to, you know, fix our dialogue issues. And when you're writing these things, it's very hard to tell the forest from the trees. You know, I am always looking at top-down perspective of things. I'm looking at you know, the overall pace and flow of the script, when you talk to actors, they're only focusing on their character. So they can really give you good insights on character motivations, on their dialogue. If something feels off to them, they'll let you know. But you have to kind of create an environment of just collaboration. A lot of actors are very shy. They don't want to say things uh, to hurt your feelings. Um, So you kind of have to pull it out of them. And we've I think that in itself is a skill, but, you know, I try and make it very clear that, you know, what I'm giving you, the script is a guideline. I'm not a big believer in, you know, scripts as far as like, you know, being the gospel. It's pretty much just a blueprint. How we get to, you know, where we get to is up to the actor. That's why we're hiring you is to give it your own creative juice. And I think you have to kind of make that clear to them. And then, as we're working in pre-production, that allows them to change the dialogue, make it more natural for them. I start th- showing them movies and clips and scenes, any kind of source material you can give them on a visual medium um, will help them with their performance. And you just have to do multiple touches. You know, we do just an overall top-down character development Zoom meeting. We go deeper into the dialogue. We'll have a Zoom meeting for that. We'll go even deeper into the dialogue. We'll have a Zoom meeting for that. And then I like to have like a meet and greet or, you know, work with, an, you know, all the actors at once so they can kind of, you know, feel us out and see that we're like a legit film company. And I think next time I'm going to just start doing some chemistry reads um, between the two characters when they interact in big scenes. Um, the actors wanted to do that. And that was one thing I think we left down into the Force 2.0, especially for your main characters, just to make sure they're clear on their relationship dynamics um, is probably something, the learning lesson that I've learned um, and that I'll, I'll incorporate in the next movie. Yeah, no, I think that really is the case. And um, again, just try and work with them as much as you possibly can. I think the last thing to kind of mention when it comes to the pre-production and wrap of this episode, um, typically what you see in found footage is there's like one or two big scares or two or three special effects things. But what do we do with every one of the special effects scenes? We've either done them before or we practice them in pre-production. So I would say while you're working on the dialogue scenes and you can do that remotely, Think what is a strategic way that you can do some type of special effects. This would be where I recommend, you know, looking outside for a special effects person, or even if it is just some type of camera trick where someone, something happens to them, it can be as much as a drag pull or something like that. Whatever your impact moment is, practice that. You know, it'd be great if you can practice essentially the whole movie, you know, if you have access to a lot of those those resources, but obviously, you know, when it comes to shoot time, that's expensive, but at least carve out some time for the big impactful moments. And if you don't have any big impactful moments, this is a warning, you should have one and you should be actively practicing what this moment is. Most found footage movies, if you watch them, they basically culminate with one or two actions going down and then that is it. And you want to be sure that you know how to nail those because again, as a found footage movie, it's much more than just what's happening. It's how you capture it as a cinematographer. Yeah, I totally agree. I remember when I gave you the script for this one, you're like, well, we've done all this stuff before. And that's music to my ears. And that's what I want to hear. I want to be making scripts where I've done the majority of the stuff already, either in pre-production or we've done them in other movies. And that just allows us to kind of avoid the pitfalls. We don't want to have, we don't have misses, right? And if you've done all the stuff before, the heavy stuff, um, the stuff that takes, you know, a lot of time, a lot of special effects, um, the odds of you having a good movie are really good. And yeah, we push, I added some other stuff in here, um, just to learn, but for the majority of our movies and our movies moving forward, you're going to see a lot of the same stuff because I know it works and we fall back on the stuff that works and we try and add a few new variables each time just to make sure, you know, it's fresh and we can, you know, find new stuff that works, but for the independent filmmakers, if you do something really, really well, continually use it, 
nobody brings it up. Um, we've done numerous movies with the same thing over and over again. We keep slitting people's throats. Um, nobody was like, hey, you guys just keep th- slitting through people's throats. I don't think it's going to be an issue. Usually with how long, you know, the timeline from releasing movies for most independent filmmakers is one to two years. Uh, people aren't going to remember your last movie. Um, so I don't, I wouldn't worry about that. If you do a scene really well, try your best to put in another movie. That's just a helpful tip. No one's going to give you a one star from that. And look, if you're going to give me a one star, cause I'm, I'm slitting too many throats, then by all means, I will, I'll eat that one star for breakfast every single day. Exactly. You want to get those one stars. They make you stronger. Um, so that's going to go ahead and wrap up the first part of this again. Uh, the next episode, we're going to talk in about production, post-production, and then promotion of your found footage feature. And we highly recommend it. So be sure to take a look at us online. If you want to be part of DBS, if you want to be on set with us, we make movies for our fans with our fans. So you can check us out there, but until then have a good one.